Uh, well, uh, welcome to uh, the monthly meeting of the Botanic Alliance. And uh, this uh, month, uh, Nick Cohen is going to talk on uh, pornography, the libertarianism of pornography. Thank you, Nick. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, David. Um, yeah, so um, I find that this topic, so the, the title um, I, I, I gave for this talk is actually also the title of a paper, which um, uh, you should be able to get hold of if you're, if you're interested, M Million Liberalism uh, and Extreme Pornography. So um, conscious that I'm at a, a libertarian meeting, I'm going to discuss um, a little bit how Mill relates to libertarian ideas as uh, as well as, as as we go through because I think it's I think it's quite interesting I think that um, uh, but of course you also came here to hear about uh, extreme pornography so the um, <laughs> so the the uh, the um, I suppose the structure of my my discussion is going to be as as follows um, I'm going to um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown on what the law actually uh, actually is, uh, the law prohibiting extreme pornography. I'm going to discuss some of the cases that have turned up in the course um, of an organization that I, I've, I, I've done some policy work for called, called Backlash, uh, defending um, people who've been, uh, uh, who've been prosecuted under this law. And, and I'm going to briefly outline the um, feminist million case for censorship. So in other words, there's a group that um, I, I've been engaging critically with who believe that there are a million and sort of broader liberal grounds for prohibiting um, pornography in a way that the extreme pornography law uh, achieves to some extent. Um, then I'm going to try and explain where they've gone wrong uh, in their uh, uh, um, interpretation of Mill and in their understanding of kind of liberal ideas in general. And I will um, explain in particular uh, the role of privacy and free expression in uh, Mill's uh, uh, own, own work. And then, uh, finally, I will, I will sort of I suppose, come together a little bit and say what, what exactly is the million alternative to prohibition? Because obviously there are features of pornography that we find objectionable. Um, and it's, uh, and it's important to understand how society you know, can kind of engage with that, can, can engage critically with that. And I'm going to explain some of the tools that um, Mill offers instead of criminal prohibition, essentially, um, that are by, by way society can kind of um, you know, uh, both accept and acknowledge, um, I suppose, sexual explicit, explicit expression, but also allow it to be criticized and challenged uh, when appropriate. And um, I always find that there's, there's usually some interesting uh, uh, um, Q&As that come up in this particular discussion. So I'll also try and keep, it, keep my remarks relatively brief so that there's a, uh, you know, so, so we have time to kind of, uh, you know, go over some more of the details. And I can also discuss, you know, more aspects of, say, um, Backlash's work as well, if you happen to uh, have a, um, uh, if, you have, if you have ideas on that. Uh, and I should, should say that actually I speak merely as myself this, uh, this evening. I have no institutional affiliation at all. I'm just, uh, uh, just, just Nick Cowan. That's just simple. Um, so what, what is the law? So in 2008, um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, Labour government brought in a prohibition on extreme pornography. And that meant they banned possession of images that realistically depict, um, at the time in, in, in 2008, in Act in 2009, four, four kind of uh, activities. Necrophilia, bestiality, uh, anything which could cause harm to certain genital regions, and anything that could cause harm to, um, uh, that, that, that could threaten a person's life. And uh, that these images also had to be supposedly realistic, um, obscene, and uh, sexually explicit. So those are the kind of conditions that they kind of tried to, um, to, to, to put on. They said that, um, and you know, you can, you can go to prison for a number of years for possession of, of these um, uh, of, of, of these images. Um, now, the main problem that liberals have with this law is that it does not actually rely on looking at um, recordings of real acts. That's not the kind of definition that they're, they're, they're running on. Um, mere depictions, so fictional depictions, which you know most most pornography is, is essentially performances, um, and also real recordings of sex acts, which are in fact consensual. Or, um, or, or can be conducted consensually, um, they are included under that definition. So in other words, the fact that the actors participating in some of these activities, um, objectionable as they are um, to many people, do not 
um, it, 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 they can be conducted safely and consensually and yet still infringe this law. On, uh, it, it, they, they, it, people can still be um, uh, prohibited from possessing the, the, those images. Um, and in more recent, uh, 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 the, the, uh, as was the, the coalition government uh, last year, um, it enhanced this, uh, this ban by saying that uh, images depicting non-consensual um, sexual penetration were also banned under this, under this law. So it meant that essentially images that depict, I suppose, rape fantasy scenarios, they are banned under, under the current legislation. So it means that uh, people who are looking at, say, um, rough sex where consensual, um, uh, I, I suppose, consent is not, is not explicitly displayed, or it could be, in theory, retracted, that mean that, that those are, are illegal to possess, even if it's well, you know, even if it's well established that they are either fantasy scenarios or they are, you know, um, performances which are, you know, which should be made by consenting actors. So that's the concern that, um, that liberals um, like myself have tended to have with this, with this law. Um, and, in, and I think uh, when first looking at this, I think, I think we imagined that the, uh, the sort of communities that might be affected by this law would be people who kind of engage in uh, bondage, dominate, domination, and sadomasochism, so kind of the, the, the BDSM community. That was the kind of thing that we thought that this, 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 may, this may infringe. Um, in practice, um, the law is actually quite confusing even for lawyers. And so as a result, um, the vast majority of cases are actually bestiality cases, where they're kind of um, real. So someone, I think someone was charged with having sex with a dead octopus. Um, well, sorry, no, 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 not charged. No, that's actually not, not illegal. No, having, possessing an image, all over the place. possessing an image of, uh, of, 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 of someone having sex with a dead, with a dead octopus. That was, the, that was one, <laughs> one case. Um, and uh, someone else was, was charged um, with the help of expert legal advice, he actually managed to avoid the, the, the conviction, um, but um, w w was charged uh, with, with having a picture of a woman having sex with a tiger. The tiger, um, depending on, on, on I, I mean, because this, this is clearly potentially an illegal image, it's hard to know exactly what happened, but I think depending on accounts, it was either a man in a tiger costume or uh, possibly a CGI tiger, or perhaps there was some Photoshop involved. But in any case, um, not, not as it turns out, it was, uh, it, it, was, it was, in fact, it was a video, but um, yeah, uh, it, it was um, uh, not, not realistic in the end. So they managed to, um, even, even though uh, the, the charge was laid and it looked like this person was going to have to plead guilty, in the end, it didn't go through because uh, prosecutors were made to realize that a jury May not may not like may not like it. So you kind of so that's actually kind of representative of, of what the cases tend to be about bestiality. And I think the reason is because you can define it relatively easily, and so it's kind of a nice, safe thing to charge people on. Um, I don't see much of a public policy reason for banning depictions of of um, bestiality, simply because I don't think that it doesn't matter how many images you've got like that out there. Most people are going to treat them as basically obscene jokes. So it's the sort of thing that I don't know the David Brents of this world might like send to a work colleague just to go like, oh, look at this. And I think that's you know it's you know it's distasteful behaviour. Um, and perhaps in some circumstances, to some people, that could even be harassment uh, if it's kind of going. But but if it's like being shared between consenting adults and it's not being meant in a kind of bad way, it's just distasteful. It doesn't go anywhere near kind of something that's worth criminalizing. Um, but I think more more problematically is that we found that um, that the Crown Prosecution Service believes that images which threaten a person's life or um, threaten to do serious harm to various genital reg regions include relatively common sexual activities, including um, uh, especially uh, fisting, which I, I won't go into too much detail, but just to say it involves um, so the penetration of um, uh, usually the anus with um, uh, fingers and, uh, and, and, and hands. Um, and it's, it, I'm not quite sure how popular this is amongst, um, say, heterosexual couples or heterosexual groups, but it, it does seem to be something that gay people engage in. I think as a as an alternative to um, penetrative sex, which you know obviously they, they, they cannot engage in. Um, I suppose what, what we call um, uh, so in, in intercourse. So they're kind of looking for um, you know kind of fun alternatives to intercourse, and so as a result actually a relatively common sexual activity, um, and also one that isn't banned. You, you're, you know, it's perfectly legal to engage in, in, in fisting with a consenting uh, adult partner. Um, 
but when depicted, suddenly that becomes illegal, um, or at least according to the Crown Prosecution Service, um, it, it, it is. Thanks to some interventions by Backlash, um, those prosecutions, some, at least the prosecutions that we know about, um, have failed, because sometimes we've managed to get expert legal advice. One case we had to get a, a, a colon specialist, a surgeon in, to explain to the jury, it's like, oh, this may look like it's harmful, but in fact, um, it's, it's quite likely not very harmful, because we know an awful lot of people engage in this activity, and I don't see people turning up in my hospital, um, you know, having, having suffered injuries from these, from these kind of activities. So clearly it is, it can be done safely. Safely, and in principle, is probably as safe as um, as, uh, 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 as other other forms of intercourse that people um, that, 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 that people engage in. So um, I think that's sort of where 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 the, where the concern is, and I think that um, I suppose where where the kind of feminist million account comes in. The, the feminist account does not necessarily extend to defending, you know, sort of um, prosecuting uh, uh, gay men for. Um, possessing images which are definitely um, of consenting participants. Um, but I think it's more, it's more a case that they feel that in principle such a law is justifiable because they feel that um, the, 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 the depiction, I suppose, of I suppose what we might call sort of rough sex, alternative sexual activities um, are kind of harmful to society in a kind of generalized way, and especially harmful to um, uh, women's status in society. Um, they'll also claim that uh, the existence of pornography in society may encourage violence against women. Um, I mean, I've, I've looked at, at, at the evidence, and it's interesting, the scientific evidence on, on this is, is kind of a bit mixed, um, but generally there's, there's very, I'd say that the, the evidence is, is not very compelling at all that, I suppose, more access to pornography, whether of a kind of violent or extreme form or just of what we might, I don't know, I, I'm not sure if, if there is a kind of mainstream pornography. It's a kind of very interesting construction, the notion there's mainstream pornography out there. But re basically, there's, um, regardless of the kind, there's not that much evidence that, that um, pornography encourages real world violence. Um, but, I think the, the, the feminist account takes a sort of step back from this and goes that in fact, um, even if um, you know we don't, we can't sort of trace some kind of direct causality. There is a kind of cultural harm associated with pornography, and so as a result, we we we, we should ban it for this um, for, for that kind of reason. And and their, and their Millian case for this basically comes from the idea that um, Mill was a sophisticated thinker. Um, that he was a uh, um, he was a feminist. He uh, he, he he wrote um, uh, the uh, the subjection of women, where he kind of came out in a kind of very robust way, not just against the state discriminating against women, but also against social forms of discrimination against women. And so he really felt that um, uh, men and women were. Um, intrinsically equal, which was kind of quite a controversial um, a kind of position in, in sort of in, in, in the Victorian times when he was writing. Um, and uh, so, so he was committed to sort of raising women's social status and equalizing it. And so they feel that, well, given that we feel, given that um, pornography harms this social status, uh, Mill would be bound to uh, support prohibition. Of, of the kind of, of, of you know of, of, of the kind that's been that, that I've just outlined. Um, so sort of far from kind of Mill being the sort of strident civil libertarian, in fact his own position would compel him to to um, uh, to support prohibition in this in this kind of case. Um, and then they have a little bit of I suppose a slightly more critical angle on Mill, which is basically to say that. Um, he has this very strident defense of, of free speech that sort of you know the kind of. Uh, um, uh, I, I suppose anti-censorship types always like to kind of cite as almost being, it, it's virtually a kind of foundational, I mean we don't really have a constitution in the United Kingdom, but the way that sometimes you get judges citing mills on liberty, you kind of get the impression it's got this, uh, it's got this sort of, sort of semi-constitutional role. Um, uh, you know, in contrast to people who feel that Mill would just definitely be against censorship, they're saying that actually, because of the way that he discusses, you know, the uh, um, uh, free speech in practice, there are loads and loads of examples, loads and loads of cases where, in fact, speech must be infringed in order to prevent um, harm of various kinds from taking place. And so, as a result, um, you know, M M Mill, Mill's defence is not as strong as you would imagine. And so, liberals who kind of take uh, Mill as being totemic, and they like to they like sometimes to cite Bernard Williams in this respect, who wrote a famous report called the um, uh, uh, well, it was um, 
report on, on obscenity uh, and film censorship for the for the Home Office some years ago, where they kind of put you know he sort of sticks Mill right up front and goes like, unless you can show that it causes harm, it shouldn't be prohibited. Um, so they kind of look at people like Williams, who kind of take that. That's just the simple viewing of um, of, of 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 Mill to be to be mistaken. Um, so I kind of uh, I found this view to be quite compelling because I think that in fact, if you can show that uh, Mill is. Uh, um, it, it, it is in fact compelled by some of his own assumptions to support censorship, that would be very, very strong indeed. Um, you know, that would kind of push the, the feminist argument very much into mainstream uh, li liberal ideas. So I thought it was kind of, it was a bold and, uh, and in many ways very compelling argument. So I kind of spent some time um, uh, looking at it. And I suppose what, what I found was that the, the arguments that they had did not quite match up to the way that um, Mill tries to, uh, I suppose, um, uh, specify his principle of liberty. And what, what I found interesting was that, in fact, Mill, I think, specifies liberty in, in some ways, um, in better ways than kind of modern liberals do. And I think it might be partly because he's got this slight classical liberal heritage. So Mill is definitely not a libertarian. He famously says it's like, um, you know, uh, the sort of... Uh, uh, the, the, the state is, is sort of is both is both too small and too big, but in different dimensions. Or is, you know, he he feels that there's a very strong role for the state that's going on. I think it's it's quite reasonable to kind of ask him whether his other views are fully compatible with that. Um, and he's not a classical liberal either, because he made a, quite a strict distinction between um, property rights and kind of I suppose civil rights to, to some extent. He really, I mean, he, he arguably he was one of the first people to make that kind of uh, that kind of division. Um, nevertheless, some of the kind of machinery of rights um, that, you know, I think he was kind of, um, uh, uh, that, that he drew from the kind of classical liberal tradition kind of was, uh, w w w was there to some extent. So I think the way that he specifies um, rights is actually quite, is, is, is actually quite compelling in a way that I don't feel that the feminist case for kind of million censorship really quite, really quite gets to. So I suppose my, um, my, my reading of, of, of Mill was to find that, so he has a, he has a principle which he then tries to unpack. So the famous principle is, is this is the harm principle. He doesn't call it the harm principle, but it's, uh, it's been labeled the harm principle latterly. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So unpacking that a bit, and sort of latterly he kind of, he, he confirms that these are not natural um, rights that he's kind of defending. He's defending political rights. They're rights that one has as member of a member of a community. Um, and therefore, they're kind of rights, um, I suppose, the rights of a political community somewhat against the state, but also potentially against other powerful actors. Um, and um, when, he, when, he, um, when he unpacks this idea, he kind of uses what I feel is, I think it's best summarized, as basically almost being um, uh, two, um, uh, two blades that kind of make up a kind of a, a pair of scissors. Um, the first being um, a right to privacy. He doesn't use the term privacy either. I think he does mention private conduct. And basically saying that the harm principle is specifically restricted to um, basically what either one does to oneself or what one does with other consenting adults or in sort of environments where no one need not um, be involved or in, in, unless they consent. So that's the kind of way, way this is. So in other words, there, there has to be some sort of um, either kind of positive consent going on or kind of very easily, easy kind of uh, way of, of sort of getting out of the situation. That's kind of the only case where the harm principle um, uh, 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 applies. So basically, I think what, what, he's, what he's kind of doing, what, what he's suggesting is that essentially um, he's kind of got this idea that there's, that, that when you're in a kind of private space where you literally cannot really impose your ideas on other people, either directly or kind of indirectly or kind of impo or, or, or impose your sort of actions or behavior in some way, that is when uh, you have a kind of basically an unlimited um, uh, right to do, as, to do as you will. That's kind of what, um, what, what Mill has in mind. And then relatedly, but actually separately from the harm principle is a notion of freedom of expression. So he believes for actually, for much more consequentialist reasons, he, he uh, or, or also more directly consequentialist reasons. He, he suggests that that uh, people must have freedom to freedom of thought and discussion, 
uh, he, he says. So in other words, um, you must have the ability to express the kind of ideas, um, uh, any ideas which relate to basically any aspect of one's life or to political ideas, ideas about art, ideas about psychology, um, ideas about science, that basically we need plenty of room for um, basically, I suppose, a, a, a competition of ideas in, 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 in in, 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 the, in, in the wider political world, and that's sort of what part of what makes a liberal society possible. Um, however, when you kind of dig into that, you find that, that that doesn't mean that he thinks that speech is intrinsically non-harmful. He's actually quite happy to accept that some forms of speech do, do um, you know, you can't say just because something is merely a form of expression. That it's that it's that it's not harmful, and he kind of classically gives this example of someone like outside a corn dealer's house saying that corn dealers are responsible for mass starvation. He says, "Well, you know, if you're out there and you're agitating, perhaps the way that say Donald Trump might be might be doing uh, that these days, and kind of inciting people to violence, or perhaps in in say Trump's case, going like, oh, if you do punch someone, I'll uh, I'll you know I'll, I'll I'll pay your legal bills. That sort of thing." Is, is expression, but it's um, uh, arguably harmful expression. It may come under uh, and, and, and may, you know, very legitimately be restricted on a, on a kind of million, uh, on a million standpoint. So the fact that he wants to offer this freedom of thought or discussion doesn't mean that he's kind of doing this, this, um, these, um, th 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 that he thinks that basically, um, th that it's got this sort of same, that speech has got this same absolute protection that what you do in private has. Um, and I, and I, and I think I think I think that's important. And I think that so I think you know in that sense I suppose some people might worry. Well, this kind of this is this is sort of a, a, a problem because if you kind of have a, a freedom of speech which is in some way abridgeable or can be intervened on the basis of, of of harm, then what kind of a right is it? I think once again, it's kind of it, it, it kind of relates to consent in the sense that basically people can't stop people from speaking but they shouldn't be forced to necessarily hear what they're saying either. So in other words, um, public broadcasts or perhaps you know, forms of, of, I suppose, public engagement, whether it's sort of in the street or maybe, uh, I suppose, in kind of unsolicited media, like imagine you're sort of sending leaflets through someone's post box or something. Those kind of um, non-consensual forms of expression, they may be subject to legitimate and, and uh, potentially quite stringent regulation. Um, and still be compatible with a kind of liberal, with with a, um, a with with Mill's conception of where um, of where rights should be. Um, it's really that it, that in fact um, the the, the I, suppose, I suppose freedom of thought and discussion is really more a right of listeners rather than necessarily a right of speakers. Um, and I think you could almost think of it as being almost like a freedom of information. In other words, if there is someone who wants to offer some information out there or wants to kind of provide, you know, whether it's kind of, you know, pictorial media or whether it's kind of just, just an essay or an article that, that you want to read and someone else wants to kind of offer it to you, that should be, what, that, 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 that should be allowed. So I think that's kind of what he's, what he's focusing on. Whereas in fact, anything else like to do with, you know, basically um, uh, engaging with someone when they'd rather not engage with you, um, th th those lines are much more blurred, but in a sense they should be because those kind of areas can in fact be harmful. And so it is legitimate to have the state um, or, other, or some other authority involved in, 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 in regulating where that, where, where, where that goes. Um, and so, um, so, so uh, overall, I kind of thought that this this position that Mill sort of stakes out is 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 quite it, it, it is quite sophisticated in the sense that in I suppose a great deal of cases you can kind of see logically where many of the kind of activities you know where, where I suppose where many of the conflicts of liberty may arise. Um, or, or how, how, how they can be resolved. So rather than um, you know, him basically offering too much liberty, liberty which in the end will lead to different liberties competing with one another, he's got a fairly good way, he's got a sort of almost a legalist way of thinking about why, um, you know, a, a, a way in which, in which we can tell when uh, one right will, will, will trump another. And he's mostly thinking about, about it in terms, of, in, in terms of consent as being the kind of final, the final arbiter. And so that means that as a result, public speech is not given Given the same kind of restriction that um, the, 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 the same the same kind of absolute protection that say you know one sort of reading in private might 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 get um, so um, 
I, I suppose what's interesting about this tool, uh, this this sort of these two scissors of the blade that I'm kind of uh, uh, the, the, these two blades of the scissors that I'm kind of um, d d discussing here is that they do meet at the point of freedom of thought. So so thought is both a kind of private act and sort of in a sense an act of expression. So I see them as kind of in, in that particular way they kind of overlap. Um, so. Uh, I, I think when, when we look at it in, in this way, we find that the private possession of extreme pornography, um, if they're recordings of consensual acts or fictional performances in some way, they do tend to be protected by, um, uh, by, by, by Mill's harm principle. And so the way that this particular law has been, has, uh, has, has been uh, uh, established and how it's been used, I think does go over what I think is a relatively consistent million position. Um, but um, uh, on the other hand, uh, some other uh, uh, recent prohibitions, so for example, the recent ban of so-called revenge pornography, uh, that I think is, at least in principle, consistent with a million position. So this is when you kind of have pictures um, that might be, uh, you know, often, uh, sadly, it's, it's often, um, uh, former partners who kind of get involved in this, in, in this, but not, not, not by no means exclusively. Um, people kind of circulate intimate images um, uh, uh, that, that, that they had of sort of former partners in order to kind of shame or kind of I don't know, take revenge on them for like uh, maybe breaking up with them or something. So it's kind of abusive behavior. And because it's a violation of consent, it's uh, I, it, 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 it in principle is um, I think I think subject to well certainly it requires legal remedies and given the seriousness of some of these activities I think a criminal prohibition is is quite possibly justified so I think that you know a, 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 I suppose a million position is able to kind of you know recognize that some of these forms of speech can be used in a harmful way just in the same way that say a um, a mafia boss might be able to go. I don't like that businessman. You know who I'm talking about, and then wanders off. Now that's you know that's kind of you know, in the context that could mean nothing, or it could mean I don't want to see that businessman again. Get rid of get rid of them. And in, and in some sense, in principle, if you can prove that's what was meant and what was understood by by, by other people, then that's in that's an in, in, in incitement to murder or even a conspiracy to murder. So in a kind of similar way, if you're using pornography in ways that are designed to kind of uh, threaten and cause distress to people, I think you can um, offer a kind of a, 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 a case, at least a million case, for saying that these things are, are, are rightly prohibited and perhaps we, we don't even go as far enough to kind of, uh, to kind of tackle these things in, um, it, 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 under, under current um, uh, legislation. Um, but, Finally, I think that what's what's kind of interesting about about um, I suppose um, Mill's position is is I, I kind of also see how it has this interesting affinity with I suppose a current call for the availability of safe spaces um, in uh, it, it, you know I suppose particularly popular on university campuses. So I, th I think for Mill, I mean he didn't have a concept of safe space in quite the same way, um, but certainly things like churches and kind of uh, civil associations had very very strong rights. Um, to include or exclude whoever they wanted on, um, you know, on a, on a very broad variety of grounds. In other words, if you didn't want someone to be present at a, at a, at a gathering, you could insist that they, that they, that they not be present, or, or alternatively, you could, you could you know, say exactly who is uh, me meant, meant to be present. And so in that, in, in that sense, um, I suppose this sort of particular call for, I suppose, to basically have, I suppose, societies that are able to um, regulate the speech which is expressed within a group, potentially a very large group. So it could be a group, say, even as large as a university. I'm not sure about a public university that's probably subject to kind of different different conditions, but certainly any free association um, ought to have the rights to basically regulate what kind of speech is acceptable in that in that in in in, in, in that kind of um, uh, scenario, and that could include restrictions on the kind of. Um, uh, 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 I suppose on, on the kind of um, uh, the, the nature of, of, of kind of, of um, images, or um, I suppose you know, I, I, I suppose discussion of sexuality that are kind of, that are kind of going on. So, it, it, in this sense, um, with this sort of contemporary drive for kind of I suppose the, the power of minority groups to decide what sort of speech is and is not acceptable in their presence. Maybe not in the whole of society, but in their presence, and also in a case where they're likely to be exposed to that kind of material, 
Mill is is kind of offering that kind of machinery, that kind of a justification for that kind of uh, machinery of civil society. So I think there's kind of an interesting kind of kind of way in which um, I suppose the classical liberal elements of of Mill, which is kind of offering the so rights to several properties, so rights to include and exclude people, um, whether as part of a as, whether as a private individual or as part of a community, you are you are um, you know th 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 those kind of the sort of still classical liberal elements within Mill can actually be aligned with kind of what um, I suppose many contemporary progressives kind of are, are calling for in order to I suppose improve as they see it their their environment. Um, so I I think I think that that that, that 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 was kind of interesting. So I see I see almost like Mill rather than being on perhaps on the kind of um, pro censorship feminist end of this kind of debate is actually more is in a sense sort of more in, uh, aligned with perhaps the queer feminist kind of approach, which kind of says that, you know, there are, um, diff you know, uh, different identities, different associations have different rules, and they, in a sense, have extremely broad powers to control what sort of language and what sort of communication is acceptable in their, in their, in their particular area. Anyway, I think I've probably already gone on much longer than I, than I was hoping for. So, um, uh, yeah, um, anyway, anything we can, um, we, we can discuss. Uh, and thanks very much for, uh, uh, thank, for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Rick. Yeah, um, I was wondering if, if you think there's anything morally in particular about sex. Um, to take the example of revenge pornography, uh, <coughs> supposedly. Now, there isn't usually thought to be anything wrong with revenge birthday party pictures, uh, or revenge praying in the church pictures, uh, where whether you've got consent or not, if you photograph somebody at a birthday party, or photograph somebody praying in church and you post it all over the internet in an effort to shame them for the horrible crime of being at a birthday party or praying in church or anything else, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, usually with uh, sex pictures, people have explicitly consented. Uh, it's unusual they're covertly taken, and I agree there's a problem with covertly taking pictures of people mm. at birthday parties or in church, uh, or anywhere in private, shall we say, even not on the street, anywhere in private, but why sex in particular? Why should that be particularly shaming? Is it just because we have a society riddled with cant and hypocrisy? Uh, but is there anything in particular about sex? Why can't we just post pictures of people who've happened to take and having sex all over the internet if we like? Well, that's that's a good question. I I, I I guess I suppose in the kind of abstract form, I kind of agree with you. There is no difference, or rather, you well, know, I mean, I mean, in, in the sense that, in in the sense that. Um, uh, <laughs> In, in, in the sense that, um, um, yeah, let, yeah, let, yeah I, I guess it's it's um, if, if for some reason you know you're praying in a church um, did like cause, cause harm in the same way, like for example, so say it was used, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Can we, can we spread yeah. that all over the internet, or is that is that revenge theism? Well, that it it, it 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 could be the person, maybe not the person, not maybe not the people who are spreading it, but the person who maybe took took the image with consent, but without consent to uh, to to uh, communicate it. That that might be the case, but I think it would be more like the way that it is understood by the person who's being, I suppose, harassed with the image. So I think that's the I think that's the the, that's the important thing, and also the way it's understood in the in the kind of community. So in other words, if say say you sort of catch somebody, um, say you catch Obama, <laughs> you don't catch it. Say he prays in a mosque, and it's put in a kind of and it's put up in a, in a kind of website where it's kind of like oh these are the people who should be you know. Um, who should be shot or something. So there's some kind of, you know, some sort of radical evangelical or, or you know, just some kind of Nazi organization that kind of like, uh, likes to sort of have those kind of images. If those, if, the, if those images represented threats and they were credible, obviously if it's the president of the United States who's doing it, it's not a very credible threat generally. But, you know, if it's, if it's a credible threat, which in the case of just ordinary members of the public, it, it might be because, you know, you don't have, a, you don't have a, uh, a protection detail. If someone is spreading those things and given the kind of way that, you know, I suppose, you know, offers of, of sex or kind of uh, engagement in a kind of sexual way is also used in a kind of aggressive way. It's used to kind of, you know, sometimes deliberately to kind of... Um, uh, put some to, to kind of uh, put someone under distress. I think you do have a you do have a case to make, and I say it's a similar case with say something like libel. So in some contexts, saying that a 
um, you know, what a fact like say I don't know um, uh, X band uh, doesn't write their own songs. Um, which I, I remember uh, that there was a, there's a famous conservative <laughs> author who got into trouble with, uh, with, 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 with that. But um, if you're going to now, now for, for some band, that might not make any difference. So for, 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 for some band that doesn't rely on the fact that they make their own songs, um, it, may, it, may, it may be completely true or it may be completely false, but it doesn't mean anything for their reputation. So it's not really something that's kind of harmful in a kind of libelous way. But for, say, for, for a... Um, a, 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 a um, a you know a band that actually did make make you know make it a, made it a fact and kind of made it a principle they did write their own songs and someone went around saying that they they didn't they kind of was harming their reputation or their business in some way then it might be the case that you could you could um, uh, sue them for libel it, at least in a kind of billion standpoint I, I understand that there may be there may be kind of good classical liberal reasons for rejecting libel for other you know for other structural reasons that kind of generates bad it generates bad outcomes but i'm i'm saying that um, libel would be an example in which you know real harm can be experienced uh, just through speech alone well, the principle and that's you're a, defending is exposing people to danger nothing particular about sex that's true yeah uh, first of all then uh, bob and then <coughs> thanks Nick, for your what's your name by the boy michael, michael. Uh, thank you nick you talk um I, I was not saying I'm, I'm aware you I'm aware that you know about, but uh, and that's the the feminist argument that is away from me an argument, mm. which is that speech itself is harm, not that it causes harm, that it is harm. I think mm. it causes harm, but I think it also constitutes harm. And to elaborate on that point, I think uh, an argument by Matthew Kramer uh, on the difference between these two things uh, <coughs> applies. I mean, he says that running doesn't cause exercise, running constitutes exercise, running is exercise. Mm. So in that context, pornography is not that it just causes harm, it constitutes harm. Mm. And of course this was this idea of uh, of uh, pornography constituting harm mm. from McKinnon and Paul in the United States to get around the First Amendment argument um, that they were trying to in the early 1980s. But it's been picked up much more recently and still being used by Ray Langton at, at Cambridge University and various others um, uh, to the idea that what pornography actually does and what it does, not what it causes, mm. which is a very, very different thing, is that um, it, 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 it subordinates women and it silences mm. women, and particularly the violent type of pornography, which is like rape type of pornography, mm. that says that women's testimony is not going to be uh, uh, accepted so much because men start to believe that no means yes. Mm. And therefore, in court cases, um, it does this. So in other words, this is what pornography does, not what it causes. So this one is away from the, 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 million, the, the, the mill type of thing. Say free speech, free, free, free speech, all you want. But this is something different. Speech mm. is action. And action is called harm. I wonder if you can comment more specifically on that area. Yeah, yeah. Um... So basically, I kind of agree with the sort of speech act idea. So there are some forms of speech which just are, um, uh, you know, just, just do constitute acts. So for example, someone saying, you know, as I say, the, the mafia boss who says, I don't like that businessman, um, you know, the, the locution, the content doesn't have anything into it. But the, 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 the constitution of, uh, that could in itself be a constitution of a threat or a kind of conspiracy to engage in, in murder. That could constitute that, that conspiracy in that, in, that, in that kind of way. So I think, I think they're right on that. And I think that liberals uh, in sort of logic shopping on this, um, I think especially uh, Ronald Dworkin, are kind of like missing the point a little bit. It's just, it just is a fact that there are some forms of speech which are kind of harmful. The, 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 the jump is where they kind of say, and pornography by definition is subordination. Because that is just that, that's something that still has to be shown. And I think that if you look at the empirical evidence of the way that the way that people receive pornography, um, in in uh, I, I suppose the way they interact with it in, in society is that people don't you know see pornography as constituting the silencing or subordination of women, um, or indeed the subordination of men if they're in gay, if they're looking at, 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 at gay pornography. They um, they're, they're looking at it. Um, for a variety of reasons, but chiefly uh, the one that we kind of tend to agree on, which is sort of sexual arousal. Um, so unless they kind of want to say that uh, in constituting sexual arousal, um, you are subordinating women. That's, unless you've kind of got that kind of logical connection, then you haven't actually got, got that. Um, then then I, th I, think, I think that's where that particular argument falls down. Uh, but, but having said that, if you're dealing with something like revenge pornography, um, uh, 
or potentially maybe some forms of pornography that might be used in a kind of political way in some way. Like say, I don't know, you um, say sort of um, uh, Trump again. So let, let's say he, he moved on from doing what he currently did and started sending explicit images of his opponents or, or, or something in a kind of threatening way. That would constitute an attempt at silencing or subordination. Um, but the fact that it happened to use, you know, pornographic imagery would would not. It's you know that that that, that would be kind of just just a, a part of the content. It's not the kind of illocutionary aspect. It's not it's not what the um, what, what what the kind of uh, expression is is achieving. Bob, and the notion of harm here is going to have far too much work to do. It's possible to harm uh, a commercial. Um, rival by making a better product mm. that makes his product inferior which I may then point out or the word may get about that it's inferior in a sense he is harmed but in a million sense I would hope he is in no way harmed at all now you can't simply restrict harm to physical damage to personal property mm. alone there has to be more than that but it can't be a great deal more than that otherwise being disappointed not being the winner of a talent contest all sorts of other things can be harms done to mm. um, So that's that point of it. Second is um, a mere dull point. Uh, it, when it's depiction, does this mean actual photographic record? Does this mean an imaginary painting of some sexual activity going on? Does this mean spoken word? Because mm. that used to be in the past, because of reasons of expense, most pornography was spoken. Yes. Spoken word. Or less than more lengthy snapshots. Might be the old rough picture, as in porno graph, mm. pictures of prostitutes, or I think that literally means. But um, to come to the harm point, it's, it's doing far too much. It's, it's either doing too much or too little here. Yes. And it, it is difficult to say which is going to count as harm and what isn't going to count as harm, or which one of these is going to count as harm that is objectionable or should be preceded against in law, or whatever it might be. So, 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 so to clarify, um, uh, Mill's position is that the harm principle um, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for intervention. So that's where he's, he's saying that in order to know whether even in the first instance there's the possibility of some kind of intervention, uh, a, a possible justification for intervention, the, the act needs to be harmful in the sense that uh, there are some non, I suppose there are some non-consenting people who are um, impacted in some way. We might not even agree that it's harmful, but they have to be impacted. They have to sort of, you could call it in economic terms, a negative externality. That's where you, where you look at it. But having said that, he doesn't think that that justifies any and all intervention in that sphere. So for example, he says that he loves free trade, he loves competition in, uh, in, in the marketplace. He just thinks that it lies on purely consequentialist grounds, not on the harm principle grounds for, for, um, for, for having it. So his argument for competition is not that it's non-harmful. He's quite happy to accept that it's harmful. All kinds of competition are harming people. But it just, it's just the kind of harm really which is enormously socially, um, enormously socially beneficial. And the kind of harm is not so bad that... Um, the, 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 oh, we're not using harm to be doing an opportunity. Yeah. Well, yeah. Fish. I mean, yeah. who isn't, really silly. Who isn't really harmed? Silly. Yeah. Who isn't benefiting from undeserved increasing opportunity yep. and but, but, losing from undeserved to some sense loss of opportunity. It's just, it's everywhere. His, his, his defence of liberty extends rather a lot beyond the harm principle. Well, what's interesting about the harm principle is the way that it tries to develop this core, which I think is to do with basically, you know, what happens between consenting adults um, in non-pecuniary settings. It doesn't even include, if, as soon as money's involved, then, that, then you're no longer in purely harm principle territory. So he's quite, yeah, this is where, this is where he starts to, you know, he, he's, as I say, he's not a libertarian, he's not a classical liberal. He's just got some of the machinery of, of classical liberalism left there. You'd be confused. What, yeah. What's your name, by the way? Esteban. Esteban. Yeah, I think um, there are some analytical differences in the examples you gave because the corn farmer and the mob, that, I mean, it's just a message and some people just like believe it and then they start a question. So then you have harm, physical <coughs> harm, and that's why the situation is wor worrisome, right? Uh, the mafia guy and mafia boss telling, um, it's not just somebody expressing their opinion and inflicting into somebody else's mind. And then you have like a boss employee relationship, and that's mm -hmm. like the, the situational context, context that you're talking. I think it would stand in any court as, as yeah, that's part of an aggression, and that's mm -hmm. why it makes it. 
Um, but this thing, and, and going back to harm, and I'm not much confused, uh, I'm not much convinced about how much more we can put into harm than physical damage, and especially not using the words that you use like stress. Mm. Because it would be more like the, um, the mafia. Revenge porn for me seems to be more like the mafia boss or anybody else saying, I don't like that restaurant because I got diarrhea by eating that. <laughs> And, uh, and I, 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 w I was really harmed by that, so I will stand at the corner just telling every people that passes by there that that restaurant gave me sick, uh, gave me sickness. So that will put the restaurant owner into stress because I'm, I'm turning uh, possible clients away from him, right? What's the, what's the parameter there? I know you just said that it's not um, sufficient, it's just a necessary thing. Yeah. To but going back to the, to the question about why porn and why it's uh, why pornography, why a, a, a revenge pornography is worse than me taking you a bad picture, or me yeah. taking you a picture while you're drunk, or me taking you mm. a picture while you're with, a, with another woman that is not your uh, official sexual partner or something like that. Mm. It seems very critical to have this conception of, of porn and stress, and it seems worrisome to have this conception of stress as harm. Oh, yeah, no, and I see. Yeah, I think I think you'd be looking for more than just stress. So maybe if I said the word stress, that possibly wasn't wasn't accurate. But I still think the stakes can be quite high. Um, it's a contingent matter. Like, so we might be in a we could be alternatively in a world where you know we don't think of sexuality in the way that we do. But it just so happens the stakes can be quite high when you expose someone's sexuality. In some in in, in in some ways. How, how so, are they? I mean, the, the the cases you told also about if it's a U.S. president, it's okay because nobody's gonna kill him because he's safe. Mm. If it, like it, it's it's not that somebody's gonna rape someone because you posted pictures of his well, it body. Might, it, it, it might be unlikely, but it might it, it, it might nevertheless be credible because I mean the fact is there's an awful lot of um, of, of violence against women in in this society. I mean it's a relatively you know it's it's a it, it, it's fortunately a kind of decreasing phenomenon, but it's a uh, it's still very much it's an ever present phenomenon. It's a plausible thing that could happen. Um, and what I'm saying is that pornography in general isn't you know is not plausibly associated with these, these kind of actions. But a specific act aimed sort of at sort of threatening someone in some way that that I think in, it is in some ways credible, particularly if there's someone with say a prior relationship or someone who wants a relationship with someone. That that. that those kind of circumstances, which is where I think, you know, revenge pornography often, you know, arises from, that those sort of things are, if not always likely, at least credible in some way. And so I think it's kind of, you know, I, I, I think that it is potentially serious um, in a way that someone offering a bad review in a, on a restaurant is not quite, you know, is, 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 is not quite the same thing. Oh, yeah, and if someone, you know, gives a, a libelous review, um, you know, maybe maybe, maybe well, there's some case. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it, yeah, but that might not be what the person is looking. You know, that that's not the kind of uh, that, that's not the kind of public knowledge well, that someone's looking stress, for. Then. Yeah, psychological stress. I, I, it has to have some other basis besides, but yeah. John, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned harm. I think as um, at least flouting what is consensual. Mm. Um, but there was. Um, famous case in the courts a few years ago of a group of homosexual men who were objectively harming each other physically, mm. but on a completely essential basis. Now, but if you're going to say, well, because it's consensual, it isn't harm, then, uh, I mean, this just shows how nebulous and useless the criterion of harm is. It mm. means anything and nothing. It doesn't point in any particular direction at all. And really, you're simply falling back on some sort of intuition about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. If it's not acceptable, then somehow you're going to mm. interpret it as harm. But there is no real theory of harm at all anymore than in Milner's proper theory of liberty. There's simply some sort of intuition going on there. Uh, and actually, I think you know his groping for the harm principle is some sort of an attempt to make sense of liberty, perhaps if, if you haven't harmed people, then mm. somehow you haven't interfered with them, because ultimately he's a liberal. And, and so this has to be 
compatible with liberty, and therefore it, it's, so it's a bit like uh, the non-aggression principle, or you know, the, it's, in, you know, it's the non-harm principle, but it's so vague as to be, uh, it's worse than useless. And I don't, I don't think Mill can be saved. Uh, it, uh, I don't think the harm principle can be saved. You know, it's got to be abandoned. You've got to come up with something more uh, uh, refined, which probably uh, much more abstract and much more controversial, you know, even more controversial perhaps, but at least it has a chance of um, uh, being something more than arbitrary and uh, you pick and choose where it fits. Yeah, I, I think the emphasis on consent does help to refine the harm principle a bit. But you're right, I, th I suppose after you've done that, it's not altogether clear what the word harm is achieving in Mill's um, in, 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 in Mill's work. So I think I think you're you're I, th I think I think you're correct that mm. that's the but I, I think insofar as it's got tractability, it's relating to to consent. Um, of course, Mill actually, there are some things that one cannot reasonably consent to for Mill. So, for example, you cannot consent to slavery. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe, although I think, I think a million really ought to be fine. You mentioned, but it's the, it's the Spanner case that you that you, you, you were discussing about the the men who were engaging. As it happens, a lot of that was actually a performance. It wasn't real, but some some of it was real, and some of it involved doing very interesting things to the male genitalia that they were, and they're having apparently a great time with it too. But um, the. Um, the um, I think I think I think our, um, on a kind of harm principle account, kind of, I think you'd be relatively easy. It'd be relatively easy to say, well, that kind of activity is fine. I think it's more like the stuff, the kind of very strange stuff, like I suppose consensual maiming or consensual yeah. cannibalism, that kind of start to kind of come where 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 where, where I think the the kind of idea is, is, is sort of, I, I think breaks down. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I th so I think you're right. There is there is there is an issue there. Pat. Uh, yes, uh, very quickly. Um, it has been a long, long time since I read Mill. I didn't read a lot about it, and I, I've forgotten a lot of this stuff. But um, I, I, I'm very suspicious of this, what you mentioned, the harm principle. Um, if you look at societies, communities, where pornography is outlawed 100%, you will see they have the greatest violence against women. Without question, mm. without that, that might not be causal, though. It might not be causal. Yeah. It might not be. It might. It might be causal, but it might not be causal. So it could be, for example, that the having a socially liberal institutions is associated both with reduced violence against women, but also, uh, but, but also with greater availability of pornography. So there's no, there's no particular. Um, but, but. Um, what if people, yeah. What if people left those societies and went into what you might consider pornographic societies, <laughs> and they attack the women in those societies. Uh, well, I mean, what would you feel about that? How would I? Feel? Well, would that be causal? Would that be a great excuse to say, well, yeah, it might be causal? Well, we're not. Well, oh, yeah, no, okay, now I see what you mean. So, in other words, you move them into a porno. Okay. Um, no, it could just because there could still be the intervening factor of these people were not brought up in socially liberal institutions, and just because they've been brought up in so in 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 you know societies that are often a lot more authoritarian and a lot poorer, you put them into new societies, they they may not adapt to the new norms immediately, or even even in that generation, that's that's possible. So it still might not be that the causality might still not have anything to do with pornography at that at that point. Well, or you could say the reverse that you need plenty of pornography to not make that happen. The, the opposite of your argument. Yeah, no, no, that, yeah. that's true. Well, I mean, if if you're interested I, I, in a nutshell, the harm principle. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just nonsense. It's, it's all harm principle. But anyway, yeah. let's watch just something else very quickly. Uh, no, I'm going to be You can come back again, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the most fascinating points you're talking about is that apparently there exists a, a group. How many a group of feminists who actually take John Stuart Mill seriously uh, and seem to base seem to base seem to base their opinions on his philosophy? Who, who on earth are these people, and how have you met them? Skeptical feminists. Uh, 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 I suspect. By uh, what's that lady's name? Skeptical feminists. Well, 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 
well, for the whole the whole reference list, um, you, you could you could look up, yeah, take a look at the, the my, my paper, Million Liberalism and Extreme Pornography. But in addition to those individuals who are focusing mostly on pornography, and I think they're mostly, I don't think that they're millions, but they're kind of showing that millions ought to believe more or less what they believe, which oh. I think is is compelling. Um, but there is, uh, I think, if you kind of looked at somebody like Martha Nussbaum, who's a liberal feminist, mm. she's you know both a million and a feminist, and um, she's um. probably a little. I mean, she's not quite so hardcore authoritarian as the feminists that I've been engaging with, but I think that that's uh, that's kind of the way. And of course, Mill was was a very strong feminist. Um, you know, kind of in many ways, you know, more so than you know a great deal of feminists even subsequently. I mean, now he might be considered slightly on the reactionary end of of like of on the on the sort of um, even, feminist spectrum. Even no platform. <laughs> well, everyone will be no platform at, at some point. So thank, thank you for platforming me. Very, very. Yeah, platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, there, there was Bob? somebody. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't miss you. Sorry, I missed yeah. you. What's your name, by the way? I'm Miriam. Miriam. Um, I was thinking um, how much the harm principle can be counterbalanced by his overall utilitarian thinking. I was thinking of like. Maybe not all familiar familiar with her, like Paris Hilton, a sex table for her got leaked. Um, it was probably very embarrassing at that moment, but mm. some say her success was based on that leaking of mm. the sex tape. So is did this creation of a big overall utility increase by that sex tape leaking, um, it, yeah, a reason to to counter counterbalance the harm principle? Say yeah, it's. Might be yeah. embarrassing at the moment, but look at your career. That's due to my. Well, you, you, you'd make a fantastic lawyer, um, but that's that's not always going to work out. So imagine that um, somebody breaks your leg while mugging you. And while waiting for the cast to be set, you you decide to buy a lottery ticket in the um, in 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 in, uh, in the hospital in the hospital news agents. There's no way you would have done that if it, you were just like wasting time, and you win a million pounds. Then in in in, in court, the guy comes. Okay, so I, I see what you mean. So so in other words, there was a more direct causal but it's, thing yeah, it's the same going on. Which yeah, maybe also this success. So let's assume it's really um, linked to the sex tape leaking. Um, yeah. It's not just a different action you did because you had your leg broken. It's really because of the same act. The embarrassment you got and the success you got yeah. due to the same action but different time on different time horizons. Um, so yeah. I, I, don't, I, I think that, that, you know, I'm not saying that would never be relevant in like a, in, in like a sort of, you know, I, I don't, actually, I think it would never be relevant in a criminal case. If yeah. it was like in a civil case, maybe it would be a bit. But there, there's a very, I mean, it, it's, it's always debated, actually, in different jurisdictions, they have different ways of looking at how to sort of sum up utilities in that way. But some of these things aren't always commensurable. You can't say it's like, oh, yeah, sure, we meant to embarrass you, but we really helped you. Yeah. It's like it's not it, it, it's it's not gonna wash in in a great many circumstances. That would be that would be my take. But it's a very interesting. Yeah, I like I like um, yeah I, I like I like that argument. Uh, but yeah, Bob and then Bob sort of off beam point. Um, there is such a thing as revenge pornography, and it's called um, it's called the History Channel um, <laughs> and the news and. Uh, we, we delight in seeing again and again the same battleships blown up, the same um, <laughs> Nazi aircraft shot down, the same this, that, and the other. We don't see the close-ups necessarily <laughs> of um, Dresden's and the, the piles mm -hmm. of corpses. So, um, isn't that awful? Isn't that? Doesn't that rather? Well, it's not, not costly to the dead, perhaps. Yeah. It might be costly to their relations, but it, it is in a sense shocking. Does it corrupt and deprave? Well, we could argue, in a sense, it does. It doesn't mean you should ban it. But you could say it is a kind of, it is pictorial. Yeah. It's about revenge. And this isn't, isn't just embarrassing. Admittedly, you can't do much about it now. These people have been killed. Yeah. Death or it might be. But it, it, it affords pleasure. Well, it, it could be argued that it, 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 um, it makes people more likely to do it again in another generation. The fact that this is continually repeated. I'm not arguing for it to be suppressed, I, I say. Mm. But simply, it is a kind of truly, I mean, the revenge has been made. Yeah. So it might, it might make it more likely that you get your revenge in first next time. In other words, that certain places are attacked, like the Middle East, by America, because they haven't quite been attacked very much themselves, but just in case they get it in first. And so they dwell upon the two twin towers 
and all of that, but yeah. never, never showed the corpses of those. They were far more numerous corpses of those they have killed themselves. So we, if we're going to play pornography as depiction that is likely to corrupt and depraved, it could be argued that mm. a great deal of ma mainstream photography does exactly that. Oh, well, I, I certainly argue that. Well, I mean, and one of, the, one of the, the ironies of this situation is that a great deal of Hollywood films uh, are, you know, created... Um, basically in non-consensual circumstances. So sometimes like you get, you know, you get these sort of famous uh, a a actors who've been asked to say, well, oh, they didn't know that suddenly they, they put a, a sex scene into a mainstream film. And so they're there, they turn up on the set and they're like, oh yeah, we're doing the sex scene, which we hadn't told you about before today. And it's like, and you're kind of, um, you know, you're kind of, you, you know, actors sort of faced with the prospect of just walking off the set and like losing this sort of important job, or you know, this thing which they didn't previously agree to. They kind of get, they kind of get, they, they have to sort of get in, in, involved with. So the fact that something's mainstream doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's kind of um, you know non harmful on my account. So I think often there's there's certainly a hypocritical angle that tends to be like, oh, we don't like porn, so we'll try and find some reason why it's harmful. When actually there, you know, on that basis, there'd always, you know, like the vast majority of, of, of mainstream media would also be, be harmful. It's not very surprising because mainstream media often hate pornography because it's a big, it's a major com competitor for it. You know, if you've got all this, um, this, all this sort of fascinating new material being, you know, being available on the internet that people are sometimes doing for free, you know, just, just, uh, you know, just as part of a community. If you kind of look at small sexual minority communities, an awful lot of it is non, non-commercial. They're just using the, the internet to kind of share to kind of share these uh, ideas and activities with, uh, with with each other. You know, this is something that really scares, you know, mainstream media moguls a lot, which is why everything on, you know, from the BBC News site to, you know, um, the, uh, you know, to, to the sun, you know, they're all kind of always going to be saying, oh, this stuff, it's very, very objectionable because it's it's taking eyes off their, off their media. Um, for example, that's why... Hang on, can I bring you in that stuff? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Pat, yeah. I'll bring you next, sorry. Oh, Okay, uh, yeah, I'll just, quote, uh, just just comment on what Bob said. I mean, yes, some histories are banned. There's nothing new about that. Mm. So, some histories you can show, or you, you would not be able to go into jail anyway, in, in some countries. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, to come back to uh, our, our pornography, uh, 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 if, if, if I can kind of just play the kind of devil's advocate in a way, um, if you take the extreme position from a libertarian point of view and say, look, there's no such thing as pornography. It doesn't really exist. Mm. It just exists in the minds of people who want to make some money and want to make some positions in society. And, you know, they, they want to sit on the board of directors and they want public money. And it, 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 it doesn't really exist. What you have got is public outrage by putting something on a poster or on TV or on the internet which people don't like. <clears throat> but when you're talking about in the private sphere, if you see it looking at something privately, it, 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 it doesn't exist on a And not only that, but how can it possibly put, be policed in an independent way? It's impossible to police it. <clears throat> I'll give you a simple example. A few years ago, I was riding along my bicycle and I went through a red light. And after a few minutes, I heard a noise, me, no, me, no, me, and I looked, there's a little guy next to me, uh, and he said he was a policeman on a, little, on a bike. Mm. And he said, stop, stop. So I stopped, and he said, well, you just went through a red light there a few minutes ago. I said, yes. He said, well, I know, because I've come straight after you. I said, yeah, but you went through the red light as well. Mm. He said, well, I'm allowed to do that, because I'm a policeman. And I said, well, no, you're not allowed to do that, because you're not allowed to break the law, because you're a policeman. Now, looking at pornography, or looking mm. at pornographers, looking at pornography, mm. makes, implicates you in that criminal offence. It's not mm. like murder or something else. Mm. You've committed the criminal offence. Now, there is a big industry around this. I mean, the, the, the Met has paid out millions and millions of pounds to coppers who claim that they've been damaged mm. by kidding by this internet nonsense. And the whole, it, it, it's an industry. I mean, there's a lot of police, there's a lot of police, as you might be aware, there's a lot of police on the sex register who are actually working as police officers still. Uh, 
um, I mean, the whole thing is just a wave of nonsense, really. But it generates a lot of money. People have made a big industry about it, this so-called pornographic. It doesn't exist, really, except in drawing on all this money. But surely these people are just as guilty as the people they claim are guilty for looking at the same stuff. And not only that, but a lot of people surely would only go into these industries, such as the police force, the CPS, mm. and all these so-called regulated industries, just so they can look at this stuff. Mm. Because they're secretly involved. They enjoy that, they can look at it and get paid for it. Yeah, Why yeah. Not? Yeah. I mean, the whole thing, mm. when you really get to the crux of it, is just nonsense. There's no question. Of it. But I was just playing the devil's advocate here. Well, yeah, in a way, I think I think what, you, what you've you've identified is there's a number of perverse incentives in the way that in the way that these. Uh, the, 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 these things happen. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's quite right. Well, and there is something there is something bizarre about the way that mere possession of an image. So, for example, it means that it's actually rather hard to tell what what images are genuinely prohibited in the UK because, say, examples of what is prohibited are also prohibited. So, yeah, no, it's 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 true that that it, it kind of it it undermines its own its own prosecute its own kind of um, I suppose coordinating role as law. It's not like law in a kind of, you know, uh, I suppose in a sort of classical liberal sense, because it's actually very, very hard to follow. Well, also, so I think that that's... It's also yeah. class-based. I mean, your leader, um, David Cameron, I mean, for putting his willy in a pig's head, mm. I mean, allegedly. everyone allegedly, I mean, it, it creates a big laugh. Now, if the local yes. dustman them... I know, but you don't know the in the, in the police station. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've all got the class element as well. Uh, well, uh, d d definitely. Let's let's talk more about this. Like, if you could stick around for another drink. Yeah, and let's get. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was just general comment to this mainstream media. So basically, um, the very traffic on porn sites is just massive, much bigger than any publisher have in their own portfolio, and uh, the. the, the <laughs> They're actually discussing the very thing of uh, money stream, and uh, they will always block it uh, uh, because just they they just feel you know that they can just lose money, and uh, some advertisers actually you know tried to advertise through porn sites, and uh, they went through ostriches in a, in a advertising to, you know entire mark, uh, advertising market. So that's the very problem that uh, they are not fighting porn; they actually fight uh, for uh, for money mm. yeah. No, I see. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, that's that's very true. Yeah. So, so I think actually, in a sense, both these discussions, th these points, are kind of like pointing out the kind of perverse incentives and the way that industries themselves have their own interests. And they're not in the business of, you know, so regulators are not in the business of, of say, um, identifying the problematic forms of pornography. They're instead interested in regulating and censoring the industry in ways that make it uh, actually in some ways marketable and also reduce it so that other industries remain, but that are more powerful, can remain profitable. So there's a lot, yeah, there's, there's an awful lot that's, 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 that's going on. And I, I um, yeah. And I, I suppose what's interesting about that is that is that I suppose Mill, when looking at the reasons for uh, either his defence of of, mar of market freedom, which he does in a kind of consequentialist way, um, or his defence of of um, you know these sort of more basic rights, or what he sees as more basic rights, which in the end are also I think utilitarian. That's more controversial. My own view is that is that he's fun. He's a everything in the end comes down to utility, but at various levels of of, of, of abstraction. But um, you know the reason why Mill was keen on these kind of uh, on these sort of institutions of rights to privacy and rights to free speech is you know not because he kind of saw s intrinsic like values in these kind of things like he just thought that oh this is just what you know people like what free people need in order to kind of engage in their in, in their he, he, he makes a few arguments that look a little bit like that but fundamentally he's worried about what states will do if they have the power to regulate. So he wants to really produce principles which reduce that kind of scope for regulation because he's very, he's very, he's quite sure that people like powerful actors will manipulate that system. 
um, or, or the, the state itself will not have the best interests of, of the people who are being regulated at heart. So in other words, he, he's not, perhaps unlike some contemporary liberals, he has a kind of sceptical angle on, 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 on the state as well. And that's, that's where he's also drawing some, you know, some inspiration from the classical liberal uh, uh, tradition. So he's kind of, um, yeah, so, so there is a kind of, um, uh, an, uh, there is a kind of shared concern there with, um, yeah, with, 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 in fact, what's interesting is for the same reason that he opposes um, the, uh, I suppose, the paternalism of the kind of the family, so the traditional family uh, where women did not have, you know, rights even formally in law, which was the, 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 the nature of, of life in Victorian Britain and, you know, m- you know, most of the world and, you know, including much of, of the US at that time. Um, you know, where women couldn't have property rights, for example. Um, that, that kind of, you know, he opposed that kind of institution um, as being sort of reactionary and, and uh, you know, sort of uh, tyrannical. But for the same reason, he also opposed the modern state um, for being, or the absolutist modern state. So in other words, he saw this sort of, he, he, he saw continuity of... of <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe we, are, we, are we meant to be finishing off? Is that what's... Is that what's going no, no, well, it isn't, but we are finishing it's, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. the reason okay. she keeps coming in. Yeah. I don't know why she keeps coming okay. in. Okay. Thank you, yes. over there. Th- th- thank you very much indeed for coming along. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. We will be able to do the... Uh, <laughs> the bar.